Uh, I'd like to start us off by reading a passage of scripture. Uh, it's 1 John chapter 4. I'm going to start in verse 16 and then read down through chapter 5, verse 5. Here's what it says. So we've come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the truth uh, that you are loved, that you love us and care for us. Father, as the passage says, it's not to deny your judgment. You do judge your holy and worthy of praise. And Father, when we ignore you and walk in a life of sin, Lord, it, it offends you and we know that. But we thank you so much that Christ loved us uh, even when we were unlovable, uh, that he died uh, in our place for our sins to redeem us and to rescue us. And Lord, I, I pray that those truths of salvation would encourage us and build us up in our faith today. Lord, help us to, to grow in our walk with you. Help us to, to put aside sin, to grow in holiness and resisting temptation, to, uh, to grow in spiritual maturity, in our understanding of your truth, in our ability to apply it to everyday life. So Lord, we commit this time of worship to you now and pray that you would use it in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. When my hope and strength is gone, you are the one who calls me on. You are the light, you are the fire that's in my soul. Oh, your resurrection power burns like fire in my heart. When waters rise, I lift my eyes up to your throne. We are more than conquerors through Christ. You have overcome this world, this life. We will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, O oh Lord. Our God, our conqueror. And I will sing into the night. Christ is risen and on high. Greater is He living in me than in the world. 
no surrender, no retreat. We are free and we redeemed. We will declare over despair, you are the hope. We are more than conquerors through Christ. You have overcome this world, this life. We will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiance in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord. Our God, our conqueror. Nothing is impossible. Every chain is breakable with you. We are victorious. You are stronger than our hearts. You are greater than the dark with you. We are victorious. Nothing is impossible. Every chain is breakable with you. We are victorious. You are stronger than our hearts. You are greater than the dark with you. We are victorious. We are more than conquerors through Christ. You have overcome this world, this life. We will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. Oh, my soul, 
worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. But still my soul sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore, forevermore. Oh, bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name, oh I worship your holy name, Lord I worship your holy name.
Boy Scout motto is be prepared. And uh, I didn't last very long as a scout, but I've always appreciated that slogan. Um, it's particularly served me well as an adult whenever I try to go camping um, because there's this curse that seems to follow me and it always seems to rain. Now, uh, you can't blame Friday night on me. I was not out in the woods anywhere. Maybe somebody else was. Uh, but when it, you know, when, what, what's happened in the past with, with our family is it's not like a, a gentle rain. You know, it's like 
we've been caught out in severe thunderstorms uh, in our tent. Uh, at one time, there was even a tornado warning. Uh, and so I've learned to pack in anticipation of a crisis, to be prepared. And I think our study of, of the Psalms that we've been doing serves sort of a similar purpose. Uh, because uh, the Psalms that, in the Psalms we're looking at, David encountered several major crises uh, during his life. And these Psalms each capture his response, how he prays in those circumstances. And so as we trace uh, his thinking, his thoughts, we're preparing ourselves. Right? We're preparing for those storms of life. We're, we're loading up our, our packs with the, the tools that we need in order to, to survive spiritually. And so today we're going to turn to Psalm 56. And it's a prayer from one of the most frightening moments in David's life. Uh, the superscript of the psalm tells us this. It says, To the choir master, according to the dove on far off terebinths, a miktam of David when the Philistines seized him in Gath. Well, uh, some think that that phrase, dove on far off terebinths, may refer to maybe a, a certain melody, like a certain tune that was familiar to people then. Um, but it also kind of reminds us, if you were with us last week, we looked at Psalm 55, and there David talks about wanting to escape his troubles to fly away like a dove. Um, so he calls this psalm a miktam, which is a title he also uses for the next four ones that we'll look at, uh, and also for Psalm 16 earlier on. But our best guess is that that word miktam simply means of writing or inscription. And so I kind of wonder if these psalms are or like journal entries, you know, a diary of, of how David processed through these crisis situations. And the crisis here with the Philistines came about as David was fleeing from King Saul. Now, you may remember Gath. It mentions Gath. That was the hometown of who? It was the giant Goliath, right? Um, the, and it, that was the giant that David killed in battle as a young man. And in fact, um, when David is fleeing from Saul, he comes to the priests and asks for, for food and asks for if they have any weapons. And what do they give him? They give him the sword that David had taken from Goliath. Right? He had entrusted it to, to the priests. And so all that to say, Gath, Goliath's hometown, was the last place on earth that David should have gone carrying that sword, which was probably very unique because Goliath was a giant and everything was probably special. Uh, but David was desperate. Right? He was alone. He was acting on impulse. And I think his thought at the moment was probably just that it would place him beyond King Saul's reach. So he probably didn't really think through how the Philistines would respond to him being there. Now, here's the story. It comes from 1 Samuel chapter 21, verses 10 through 15. Listen as I, as I read it. It says, David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, Is not this David, the king of the land? Do they not sing to one another of him in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. And David took these words to heart and was much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see the man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen that you've brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? So David ends up escaping because of that. But think of it here. He's pushed right to the breaking point. He's exhausted. He's been on the run day and night from King Saul. He must have not been thinking clearly. He walked right into the hands of his enemies and then realizes that it was a mistake. And so fear 
seizes him in that moment. I mean, this is, this is the same man who stood up to Goliath as a young man, right? But he's worn down. So much so that he pretends to be insane. And I kind of wonder if it was convincing because he was really that close to it. You know, if you've ever been through some sort of trial where you can't sleep and you're anxious and you're worried, it takes such a toll on you emotionally and physically. I mean, you think of what David must have felt in that moment. And so this psalm, Psalm 56, shows us how he prayed in that circumstance. I mean, for all that he lacked emotionally and physically, David was well prepared spiritually. And he overcame his fear by clinging to four truths about God. Now, the frightening circumstances that you and I face, they may be entirely different from David's life. I'm sure they are. But we can cling to those same truths. Those things will prepare us as well. And so the first truth as we make our way through the psalm here, we'll walk by it, through it verse by verse, is the truth of God's sovereign grace. Soon after my wife and I were married, we planned a camping trip. And uh, we were supposed to meet up with friends and family in the mountains uh, north of Los Angeles. That's where we lived. And, uh, and so the plan was to share food and cooking utensils and so we didn't bring everything that we needed for a weekend on our own. But as the sun began to go down on that first night, no one else showed. Right now, uh, we weren't afraid per se. It was unsettling. It was a little bit concerning. And all, the, all of those people had good reasons for canceling at the last minute. But we had no way to communicate, right? No mobile phone. No radio or walkie-talkie or anything like that. And even if we did, there wasn't anything they could do to help us. But in those times when fear threatens to overwhelm us, we can communicate with God through prayer. You don't have to have a phone. You don't have to have a radio. He's always listening, and he has the power to come to our aid. He rules over all things. He assures us through his promises and guides us through the wisdom of his word so that we can draw comfort from the truth, like I said, of his sovereign grace. And so David began his prayer with this truth in mind. Psalm 56, verses 1 through 4. He prayed this. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. All day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. But he says, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? So David was facing this unrelenting opposition from every side. Saul and his army were pursuing him. He was surrounded by the Philistines. And he says there in verses 1 and 2, he felt trampled, attacked, oppressed but not hopeless. He believed that God still had the power to alter his circumstances. And so he prays for mercy and grace, he, for God to grant him relief from these trials. Now, I think a lot of people wrestle with the idea, in circumstances like that particularly, the idea that God could be sovereign and in control, right? Because some people assume that if God is, uh, is, is really good, and all-powerful that he would then prevent any suffering from ever entering your life. Right? And so they conclude that he, he, must not, he must not either be good or he must not either be powerful. But what, what people fail to take into account is the wisdom of God. Because in his wisdom, he doesn't control people in some robotic sort of way. He allows them to make choices that have consequences uh, for themselves and for others. And so some people may choose to reject God and to commit selfish, evil deeds that uh, may even inflict suffering upon others. Or, on the other hand, they may choose to trust God and obey Him and, and to pray to Him for help when they suffer. And so in His sovereignty, 
in his wisdom, he works through all those details, all those events, to still accomplish his good purpose. Now, in this case, Saul chose to disobey God in his jealous attempt to kill David. He was pursuing after him. The Philistines, they chose to worship false gods, to fight against Israel, including David. But as David says here in verses 3 and 4, he chose to place his trust in God. He chose to even celebrate, to praise the word of God that had been revealed in the books of Moses and through the prophet Samuel. Because Samuel had come to David and anointed him, announced that he would one day become king. And so in that moment, David chose to hand over his fears and entrust his life to the sovereign grace of God. Now, that's not to say that he wasn't afraid. We read back in 1 Samuel, right? He was. He was very afraid. But he made this commitment, this choice, this decision that he was going to trust God in spite of that. So do you believe in in God's sovereignty? Do you believe that he rules over all things? Uh, When you're afraid, do you pray to him? Find your strength in his grace, his power, his wisdom. The next truth that comes out in the passage as we continue is that David clings to the truth of God's ultimate justice. You know, some places, if you're out in the wilderness, some places are known for flash floods, right? They sweep along with very little warning, and and those, those waters will destroy everything in their path. And so if you're in the wilderness and the rain begins to pour, you need to find your way to safety on higher ground. So the way that you prepare for that is by having a map, right? A topographical map that shows you the lay of the land, that helps you find your way to higher ground. And God's word is that kind of map for our spiritual lives. It teaches us about God's ultimate justice and that it will rain down in a future storm. It it warns us of the downward path that leads to judgment. It guides us to the high ground of salvation. And we'd be foolish to ignore it. And so as David wrestled with his fear of Saul and the Philistines, he remembered this truth of God's ultimate justice, and he he drew comfort from it because it reminded him that he ultimately had nothing to fear. His relationship with God placed him safely on the high ground. But his adversaries were heading in the opposite direction. Take a look at Psalm 56, verses 5 and 7. David says, All day long they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife. They lurk. They watch my steps as they've waited for my life. For their crime will they escape? In wrath, cast down the peoples, O God. Now, David's not just making some sterile moral judgment here, right? This was, this was personal. These attacks were not uh, solitary or random. These people were obsessed with hunting him on both sides, both Saul and the Philistines. Some translations of verse 5 there begin by saying, they twist my words, right? They were constantly looking for any opportunity to catch him, to turn people, uh, the population even in Israel against him so that they could kill him. And so he characterizes them as wicked criminals. And he knew that their wicked behavior provokes God to wrath. And there's a clear history of that, a pattern of that, when we look through the Old Testament. From the very beginning, remember Genesis 3, God drove Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden uh, after they disobeyed him. Uh, we come to Genesis 6, and he determined to blot out the wickedness of humanity with a worldwide flood during the days of Noah. We come to Genesis 19, and he he rains fire down on Sodom and Gomorrah for their outrageous sins. And so David asks in his prayer, God, are you going to allow my enemies to escape? And he knows the answer. He knows that God will not do that. And so he prays for justice, for the wrath of God to be carried out. Now, as I've said 
previously in, in the study of the Psalms, God's justice is good. We should never be embarrassed by this area of biblical teaching. It assures us that no uh, evil will ever go unpunished. It, so it provides a sense of comfort to those who've been wronged, who've been oppressed. But it also stands as a warning, of course, right? That, that God's standard of justice is not the same as the one that we see in our society. He, he rejects some of the behaviors that, that society accepts. And the next judgment will not be through a flood like with Noah, but it'll be through fire. We read about it in the book of Revelation. And so it all reminds us that we're all guilty. We're all sinful. We all need to be rescued from judgment through faith in Christ who suffered the penalty for our sins and our place on the cross. And so we need to be prepared. Right? We need to understand the idea of God's justice, to apply it to our own life, but then to draw comfort from that when life is hard and there doesn't seem to be, uh, uh, you know, when we, we're facing opposition and hardship, uh, animosity from people. That leads to a third truth. And it's the truth of God's personal love. You know, find this next item here in my bag. Water is essential for survival too, right? And the harsher conditions are, the more you need. Uh, because heat, you know, heat causes you to sweat. And, and, and if you're stressed, if you're anxious, that, that causes you to perspire too. And if you're not careful, you can become dehydrated. Have you ever experienced that? When you get dehydrated and your muscles ache and you're just fatigued and... If it goes on long enough, your mind can even become dazed and confused. And so in our spiritually hard times, uh, life's painful experiences, they wear us down, they make us feel alone. And it's like our vitality seeps out even through our tears. And we can begin to lose hope. But the truth of God's personal love is like water for our souls. Here in Psalm 56, verses 8 through 11, David uses this amazing, very unique picture to capture the level of God's concern for us. Take a look. He says to the Lord, You have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back on the day when I call. This I know that God is for me. In God, whose word I praise. In the Lord, whose word I praise. In God, I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Right, David's believe that God's concern for us is intensely personal. In other words, he notes every time we toss and turn. He's aware. You know those sleepless nights? God knows. He, he, he paints this picture that God captures each tear and saves it. As if he's got a bottle there and he's, he's capturing it and holding on to it. That he, he cares that much. He knows what's going on in your life. He tracks every experience. He's, he's got a log. He's written it down. Nothing escapes his watchful care. Jesus talked about that too. He, he reinforced it in a different way. You remember he, he told the parable of the lost coin, the parable of the lost sheep. And right before he tells that parable of the lost sheep, he says, See that you do not despise one of these little ones, one of his followers. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. He presents this idea that God's watching over us and that all of his angels, his angelic hosts, are waiting for any sign from him that they should come to our aid. It's that level of personal concern. And so having a relationship with God gave David assurance. He knew that God would support him. He was confident that his adversaries would eventually give up. And so he repeats the same words that he said earlier in the psalm. He talks about his praise for the word of God. He again expresses his trust and commits himself to putting aside his fears. And that whole spirit, that whole attitude only grows as we get into the New Testament, right? 
we read Romans 8. Uh, I'm going to read all, verses 31 through 39. It's so good. It says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So when you're afraid, trust in the truth of God's personal love. Find comfort in your relationship with Him. He cares for you and watches over you. He knows every struggle and is with us through it all. One more truth. It's the truth of God's saving purpose. My wife is the, honestly, the true camper in our family. Uh, and, and when she was growing up, her family would regularly go camping. They had a pop-up trailer, uh, but they also took backpacking trips, hiking into remote areas. Uh, but they ran into a pretty frightening problem the last time they did that. As they finished dinner and they were hanging up their food, as you're supposed to do at their campsite, a bear wandered into their campsite and actually tore into their tent. And so even though it was getting dark, they, they packed up. Um, it, they, had hike, they had spent the day hiking 10 miles into their site. So it's getting dark. They hike back down the trail along a mountain, winding mountain trail by flashlight. Right, scary thing. Now, when we face frightening circumstances, God is our light. He rescues us. He's the one who guides us through the darkness. He leads us to understand his, his saving purpose for our life. He wants us to worship him and to live for him. And so he, he empowers us. He transforms us. Even as he feared for his life, David reflected on this saving purpose of God. He concludes Psalm 56 in verses 12 through 13 by saying this. He says, I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you. For you have delivered my soul from death. Yes, my feet from failing, that I may walk before God in the light of life. So David feels this need. Even as he's struggling with his fear, he feels this need to express his gratitude to God. And since he's, the, the way he phrases it here, you have delivered my soul, it could be maybe uh, a reflective response that happened afterward. Right? He may have written these words, and even the whole psalm, after his experience. But he also seems to be making a vow here uh, to offer sacrifices of thanksgiving in the future. So he could be speaking of, of other times. Maybe he thinks back to times in the past when God delivered him, before he was in this situation with Saul and the Philistines. But he might have also been using something that we find in Scripture sometimes. It's called a prophetic past tense, where you're looking to the future, but you speak in the past tense as if it's already happened. Sometimes we find that in Scripture. The idea here is that David knew that God wants more than just a one-time offering. He saves us. He works in our life so that we'll have a relationship with him, so that we'll walk before him, that we'll maintain this relationship of dependence and obedience. He wants us to follow his light, right? allowing him to guide us through life. It's like that great little verse in Psalm 119 where it says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And we find a similar expression of God's saving purpose in Ephesians chapter 5, 8 through 11 in the New Testament. Paul talks, is talking about uh, immorality and immoral speech, immoral behavior. And he says to the believers, for at one time you were darkness, 
But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. You know, let's be honest. Sometimes people use anxiety or fear as an excuse for sinful behavior. Um, They feel hopeless. They look for relief, maybe in the wrong ways. Um, But we can't allow the darkness to overcome us in our fears. We see in the psalm where when we're afraid, we, we need to trust in God's saving purpose. We, we need to follow his word, to walk in his light, believing that he, through it all, is going to help us grow through the hard times. And so we cling to this truth of his saving purpose. Can't predict what frightening sorts of situations you may um, that may lie ahead in your future. Right? We don't know. But like David here in Psalm 56, you can know the one true God who carries you through those sorts of situations. You can cling to these truths of his, his sovereign grace, his ultimate justice, his personal love, and his saving purpose. So remember back in the beginning of the psalm, David began by seeking God's grace. And that's where we all start. Have you ever done it? Have you ever acknowledged that you need God's mercy and grace, that your sins separate you from God? The New Testament tells us that you can be reconciled with God through Jesus Christ. If you turn to him and cry out for his mercy, you can receive this grace that he offers to us through through faith. One of the passages I quoted today was, of course, from Romans 8. And if you want to understand more about God's sovereign grace, that is a great passage that, that can really help us through times of suffering. I want to encourage you to spend some time thinking through it and reading it. But if you already have a relationship with God, are you finding that peace? Are you finding peace in Him? It's always good to renew our trust in the Lord, to declare our faith the way that David does here in verse 4 and verse 11 of Psalm 56, where he says, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid, right? That's a commitment. It's a pledge. Lord, I'm going to trust you. As I feel afraid, this is my commitment. We need to choose to respond that way. And if you have experienced God's help in your life, are you walking in his light? How how do you need to grow spiritually? What what could you do to express your gratitude to the Lord? What would deepen your relationship with him? My prayer is that we would overcome by faith in Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you today for this beautiful morning, the time to look at your word together. And we're thankful again, Lord, that when we turn to the Bible, we don't find um, some nice and neat portrayal of life that's plastic and not realistic. But even here in this psalm, we see one of the heroes of the faith deeply struggling and being pushed to the breaking point. And Father, like we've said, you know us. You, you capture each tear in your bottle. You know the struggles we've all been through. And yet, Father, we thank you that you are gracious, that you welcome us to come. And even though we fail time and again, Lord, you welcome us back in your grace. Lord, help us to make that commitment again, to trust you, to follow you, to walk in your light. Give us the courage to 
to choose to believe, even when everything else is telling us to be afraid. Lord, we thank you that you offer us this opportunity to have a relationship with you. Lord, help us to cling to that and to hold to it, and to live it out in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Behold our King, 
nothing can compare. Come, let us adore Him. You will reign forever. You will reign forever. You will reign forever. You will reign forever. forever. Behold our God seated on His throne. Come, let us adore Him. Behold our King, nothing can compare, come let us adore Him. Uh, Let's just close in prayer today. Father, thank you for this time. Lord, help us to continue to grow in our faith. And even this week, Lord, uh, if we encounter trials, circumstances that make us feel afraid. Lord, help us to trust, to walk with you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks.